Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I'd like to welcome you all to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Los Alamos. We are small in numbers, at least to start, but I'm trusting that we are mighty in spirit. And so thank you for being with us this morning. And those, for those who are worshiping with us online, thank you for welcoming us into your home wherever you're gathered for worship this morning. I'm Reverend John Nash, joined in worship leadership this morning. Uh, Kathy is our lay reader. First light this morning is made up of Valerie, Nels, uh, Lee, and Camille. In the sound booth, we have Don, Dennis, and Lynn and Bob and Julie are ushers. So thank you to them for their worship leadership this morning. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, said, whoever you are, whatever faith you were born into, whatever creed you confess, if you have come here to find God, you are welcome here. And we are indeed glad that you are with us as we are continuing in our worship series on the 12 minor prophets. And so we hope that you have come with the expectation that we will encounter the risen Christ. The Holy Spirit will be moving and working amongst us here this morning. We'll be transformed simply by gathering together as the body of Christ. So I'm going to invite you to stand as you are comfortable. Remain seated if that is more comfortable as Kathy leads us in our opening prayer. Together, let us pray. O oh God. Your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing our hearts and souls. You know the thoughts and intentions of our hearts before they ever come forth. But while you are slow to anger, we do know that judgment is present, and those who violate your equity and justice must repent to receive your forgiveness but your mercy is from everlasting to everlasting because of the gift of Jesus, our great high priest, who knows our weaknesses and yet is without sin, so that we may approach your throne of grace with boldness to receive your forgiveness, to receive healing and wholeness through Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. For those in the sanctuary, as we sing, you are invited to come forward to light a candle of joy, hope, or concern, whatever it might be that we need to lift up to the Lord. Those worshiping online are also encouraged to light a candle where you are. You are invited to remain standing as you are comfortable, or be seated if that is more comfortable, as we continue worshiping and celebrating the life abundant that has been given to us because of Christ. We never will run dry. So living water flowing through, God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. Just to know you and to make you know we live. Show them who you are. So living water flowing through. God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one Jesus.
is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable. Anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable. Anything is possible. Yes, joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable, love unstoppable. Anything is possible. Just to know you and to make you known. We live. to thrive, and thriving, um, the, the um, devil, Satan, may come, he may try to convince us that we're not thriving, that things are not well, that we cannot be good, but who shall we fear? Let's sing about that.
always by my side. Grace. Grace is there for every one of us at all times. But until you really believe, until you have Jesus right there, right here, in your heart, that's when you really believe. And that's when you know that Jesus is right there with grace.
And you may be seated. And let us be in an attitude of prayer. Oh God, it is your amazing grace that rains down upon us and all of the creation. It is your amazing grace that allows us, as the writer of Hebrews says, to approach your throne with boldness. To approach you with boldness because of the gift of your Son, who has set us free from our slavery to sin and death, has set us free to live as your servants, has set us free to live in your love. And it is that love that pours into us through the gift of the Spirit, who gives us the fruits of love and joy peace and patience, kindness and generosity, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Not as things that we get to pick and choose, but to live in all of those things. To be your love and to be your peace to the world. And through our faithfulness, to be witnesses, lights in the darkness. And so as we gather here as your people this morning, some of us come in the highest of highs and some in the lowest of lows, even in the valley of the shadow of death. But we know that you are ever with us, that your faithfulness is endless. And so we pray for those who mourn this day. We pray for all those who are impacted by war and violence. We pray for those who are recovering from the natural disasters, hurricanes and fires and other things in places known and unknown. And we ask for your grace to be known in those places and that the church universal will respond and be your hands and feet to a worn and weary world. A world awaiting the coming again of your son, Jesus Christ. A world that needs his light poured out through your church for all to come to know and to bow down and to pray and give glory to his name. And it is in the name of Christ that we pray and all the church says, Amen. Amen.
Our reading is from the prophet Nahum, who brings a word of hope for Judah, that God will end their afflictions and restore them to glory. And with that comes a word of destruction for Nineveh, which Nahum calls a city of bloodshed that practices endless cruelty. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. An oracle concerning Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh, a jealous and avenging God, is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and rages against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry, and he dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the bloom of Lebanon fades. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt. The earth heaves before him, the world and all who live in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and by him the rocks are broken in pieces. The Lord is good, a stronghold on a day of trouble. He protects those who take refuge in him, even in a rushing flood. He will make a full end of his adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Why do you plot against the Lord? He will make an end. No adversary will rise up twice. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. If you've not already been using your scripture insert, I invite you to take that out. On the back is a place to write things to remember from today's service. And you need this immediately after today's message as well. So some of you may have heard uh, a fundamentalist uh, pastor who was celebrating being able to host vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance at an event outside of Pittsburgh. Vance had been scheduled to appear in North Carolina, but because of Hurricane Helene had had to change locations. And the preacher said, and I quote, I'll be honest with you, I take that as a direct act of God. Pittsburgh wasn't even on the map. It was supposed to be North Carolina, and God switched it that fast for you. In other words, hundreds of thousands of people's lives were literally washed away. Hundreds of people died, many more still missing, so that Vance could be in Pittsburgh. Now, I've heard people say terrible things about God, and this is one of them. And yet, even in its grotesqueness, There is still a kernel of something that people say about why things happen the way they do. Often we don't really think about the consequences of what this actually means. Of saying that, right, God turned the storm so it didn't hit us. But God did turn the storm so it hit lots of other people. Or why God allowed one person to live while others died. There is clearly a prevalent idea that God wreaks punishments upon peoples, cities, and nations. That God punishes sin, including sometimes bringing ultimate destruction. And let's be honest, that's sometimes the reason given why a storm has hit a particular area. And also reasons given why storms that have hit our lives, metaphorical storms. So yesterday, our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrated Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is the holiest day on the Jewish calendar, the most important Jewish holiday. It's a day set aside to repent for a sin that they've committed in the past year. You might be familiar with the idea of a scapegoat in Scripture that's happening on Yom Kippur. 
And so besides for going to uh, synagogue to be in worship, it's also a day accompanied by fasting, prayer, and refraining from work. Because of its importance within Judaism, there are even non-practicing Jews who will recognize Yom Kippur and follow some of the things set aside for that day. Rabbi Harold Kushner, best known as the author of When Bad Things Happen to Good People, recounts working with a couple in his synagogue following the death of their college-age daughter very suddenly. He said that he went over to their house expecting anger and grief and shock, but he said he did not expect that the first words they would say to him were, you know, Rabbi, we didn't fast last Yom Kippur. He said that when this couple was struck by tragedy, they reverted back to the basic belief that God punishes people for their sin. And thus, the death of their daughter had to be caused by their failure to fast and pray on Yom Kippur. If only they had done that, they were thinking and said to him, their daughter would be alive. So these are not unique stories. Because they happen all the time with people seeking to, to give some meaning, some reasons, for some purpose for why what has happened. Usually the bad things have happened in their lives or this happened in the lives of someone else. And it's usually somebody else who's saying something along the, the lines of, well, everything happens for a reason. Or, this is part of God's plan, even if we don't know what God's plan is. And there is certainly scriptural background for that statement, although it's not as strong as those who use it would like it to believe. But the evidence still exists, and the large, largest argument for that, especially that we are punished for the sins that we commit, comes from the prophets who clearly make that statement. So as we've been talking about the 12 minor prophets, we're now halfway through that. In week 7, we've talked about the fact that they say that Israel or Judah or Nineveh or Edom will be destroyed because of what they have done. That God is going to destroy these nations either because they have violated what God has called us to do, in particular how we treat the least of these or for foreign nations, they will be destroyed because of how they have treated Israel and Judah. But regardless of the reason, the point that they make is that these are happening because God is causing them to happen. Not that God is allowing it, God is causing it. God is specifically punishing these nations. And so we've sort of danced around the edge of what this means, but we haven't addressed it specifically about what this means for us, for our faith and our understanding of God. So that's what we're going to try and tackle today. Do bad things happen to us and to others and to nations because God is punishing us for what we have done wrong? That's certainly what the prophets seem to imply, with Jonah being the exception because the people of Nineveh repent. But Nahum, however, also prophesies about the coming destruction of Nineveh because of what he says are their abhorrent behaviors, and they were a really nasty uh, military. And Nahum revels in being able to make this proclamation. And so Nahum's probably a great place to look at vengeance and violence that we see given in prophetic works. Because Nahum says God has an avenging nature. And some of the imagery that Nahum gives is very, very violent, including descriptions of sexual violence and the church has largely ignored Nahum, I think, because of some of that violence. 
Because along with Obadiah, is only one of the 12 minor prophets who's not included as a reading in the common lectionary, recommended scripture readings for Sundays and high holy days throughout the year. Like the other minor prophets, we know absolutely nothing about Nahum. Once again, it's not even a list of kings given at the beginning of his book. But he does refer to the fall of Thebes, which happens in the year 663. And he's writing about the coming destruction of Nineveh, which happens in the year 612. So somewhere between those dates, probably closer to the destruction of uh, Nineveh, which ha is destroyed by the Babylonians, is probably where his prophetic career is taking place. And one other interesting piece you can take away from this is Nahum is found only in two places in Scripture in his book. And then in Luke's genealogy of Jesus... Nahum is listed. It does not say the prophet Nahum, so it could be somebody else, but because this name is, seems so rare, they might be one and the same person. Although Nahum and Jesus' message are very different from each other. So when we looked at Jonah two weeks ago, we noted that Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh, because he says he knows that God is merciful and that when they repent, God will save them. And Jonah wants to see the city destroyed. He doesn't want justice done. He wants revenge. He wants retribution. So he doesn't want Nineveh, to see Nineveh saved. So he doesn't want to go there. Nahum is delivering basically exactly the same message of coming destruction. Except he says that God is not merciful. God is slow to anger, but God is an avenging God. God is a wrathful God. God will not save the Ninevites. God will wipe them out, destroy them utterly because of what they have done wrong. And Nahum is joyful in giving this proclamation. So in some ways, Jonah and Nahum's prophecies are exactly the same and yet the outcomes are very different. In Jonah, God is merciful and saves. In Nahum, God is vengeful, wrathful even, and destroys. So which is it? In which God do we prefer? Which God are we going to choose? The God of love or the God of wrath? And if we choose one or the other, how do we come to terms with rejecting that other vision of God? Nahum clearly prefers the avenging God. The warrior God who will punish the Ninevites for what they have done to Israel and to Judah. That he will annihilate them for their crimes. And so the destruction of the Assyrian Empire, which Nineveh is the capital city, is not just something that happens. It's not just one of those things. It's not just a matter of chance. This is the work of God. This is God saying the good will prevail and the evil will be punished. This is part of God's plan, Nahum says. And let's be honest, there is something deeply appealing about a God who will set things right. Right? Who will reward those who do what God wants and will punish those, especially those who commit evil. And that's all well and good until we actually think about these stories that we have been hearing and we begin to remember what sets up this situation in the first place. Because we are told by the other prophets, Micah included last week, that Israel, the northern kingdom, will be destroyed because of the way they have disobeyed God. That they have done evil in God's eyes. And who will bring destruction upon the northern kingdom of Israel? It's the Assyrian Empire. Whose capital city 
Nineveh. So if God is using the Assyrians to destroy the Israelites because of what Israel has done, can we then simultaneously say the Assyrians have to be held responsible for what they did to Israel? Does that seem fair? God caused this to happen. Now, we might then say, well, maybe the Assyrians went farther, right? They were more violent than what God actually wanted, and therefore they're guilty of those sins. But why didn't God stop the Assyrians from doing that? Why didn't God keep their destruction within limits? And what saying that the Assyrians went too far also then says is this is not part of God's plan. And then there's a simple fact that what seems to be called forth here in Nahum and the other prophets as well is that God is going to respond to violence and destruction with more violence and bigger violence and destruction. And does bigger and better violence, getting revenge, ever solve any problems? Or does it simply continue to lead to now even bigger and better violence in a vicious cycle? And these aren't flippant questions I'm asking here. If we are going to take Scripture seriously, I think these are the questions we have to ask. We might not like the answer, we might not even get an answer, but we at least have to ask the question. And I also think we have to take into consideration Right? If Nineveh is going to be destroyed, what about people who have nothing to do with how the Assyrian Empire operates and what their military does? Who are innocent victims, we might say. Are they just collateral damage? That God is going to wipe out the guilty and innocent alike because of what the guilty have done? So one of the, the verses that's played a major role in the Minor Prophets so far comes from Exodus, and God says to Moses that God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that sounds great. That's the God we want, right? And that's what Joel lifts up when we looked at the prophet Joel of his message of hope. That's the portion of that passage um, that he relies upon, that God is merciful and slow to anger, and therefore God will relent. But the passage in Exodus actually continues on. It says that God's forgiveness does not mean clearing the guilty, which Nahum lifts up, but visiting the iniquity of parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. So how just is that? How fair is that, that you can be punished for something you didn't even do that was done by your great-great-great-grandparents? And yet, that is what Nahum appears to be proclaiming here. He says God is slow to anger, but God will get you in the end if you don't do the right thing. And so all the passages that say that righteous people will be protected from harm, right? Some of those hymns that we sang this morning clearly show us then that none of us are righteous. Because if you were truly righteous, you'd never have any bad things happen in your life. Has anyone here ever lived a life that has not had at least one bad thing happen in it? Clearly, you are not righteous, and I include myself in that. That's certainly what Job's friends tell him when he is suffering. Job says, but I'm a righteous man, and they say, clearly you're not, because clearly your suffering is coming from God. God is punishing you for something you just don't know what it is. So there's an Iranian folk proverb that says, if you see a blind man, kick him. Why should you be any kinder than God is? 
Because that's one of the major problems in believing that bad things happen because you have done bad things. It means that God is no longer on the side of the victim. God is on the side of the perpetrators. God is on the side of natural disasters. God is on the side of those who do evil. If we look at the Holocaust and we're to say that the Jews were obviously killed and tortured along with others who died in concentration camps because they did something wrong, I hope we can find that morally repugnant first, but it also says God therefore is on the side of the Nazis not on the side of those who are being killed. As the German theologian Dorothy Soule says of such a justification, who wants such a God? Who gains anything from worshiping that God? I might even ask, can we worship that God? If we believe that God is with people in their time of suffering, that God hears the cries of those in despair, right? The psalmist says, Out of my depths I cry unto you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. If we believe that God hears those cries and it is God who gives us strength and power and endurance to get through those times of our lives, can we simultaneously say God is the one who caused those things in our lives? So what Job's friends say to, to Job, your suffering is because you're not righteous. God is punishing you for your sin that idea is not only refuted by Job, it is refuted by God. Another refutation is found in the prophet Ezekiel who says, A child shall not suffer for the iniquity of a parent, nor a parent suffer for the iniquity of a child. The righteousness of the righteous shall be their own, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be their own. That is, if God is punishing someone, that punishment does not pour out onto others. Children are not punished for the sins of their parents, which is what that couple who say to Rabbi Kushner, if only we had fasted at Yom Kippur, are saying. And parents are not punished for the sins of their children, nor are neighbors punished for the sins of neighbors. And so what makes the punishment we hear about in the minor prophets, even in the major prophets, so extreme is that everyone gets caught up in this catastrophe. And if we want to argue that, that maybe, right, there are no ultimate innocent people, that they're being punished for their other sins if they were caught in Nineveh at the wrong time, if you're going to be punished for something, shouldn't you at least be told what it is that you're being punished for? Because I think that too requires explication if that's what God is doing. And the other problem with this scenario is that it makes obeying God not an act of love, but an act of fear. God is not loving or forgiving God's a bully, to use Philip's language when we talked about who God is. God is vengeful. God is angry. God is a tyrant. Now, this is not to say that God doesn't get angry. Because we see that in Scripture. Jesus gets angry. And we have to learn how to deal with that side of God's personality. A different message for a different day. But even when you get angry and you need to correct, right, to give some discipline, that comes out of a place of love, not retribution. That there's control and limits to that. Because I have to say that my baseline for belief in God 
is that God has to be better than I am or other humans are. Because I want to strike out in anger. And there are things I don't want to forgive. And there are people I don't want to love. But God's forgiveness is endless. And God's love is endless. And God is looking for ways, my, I believe, to love us, not to punish us. And correction that kills people doesn't teach anything. Right? So you might have seen there was a, a case that was just uh, finalized in Illinois this week of a father who beat his 17-year-old daughter to death because she lied to him. And he just got life in prison. I think we call that repugnance. But then we get, want to give the same attribute to God? No, God has to be better than we are. It's not a God that I can worship. And we see that in, not only in Scripture, we see it through the gift of Christ, who came not to condemn the world, but to redeem it, to save it, to offer God's love, to restore wholeness and relationship to show what love and forgiveness really look like, to bring healing, restoration to our relationship with God and with each other. And so when I see, when we see disasters, both natural and man-made disasters, when we see pain and suffering, illness and disease, when we see destruction and death, I believe that God is present in those situations, not because God caused it, but God has responded because we cry out to God in those moments. Even when our cries are too deep for words, as Paul says, that the Holy Spirit speaks for us in those cries. And that God is not there in judgment, but in love. And while it might be easier to believe, it might give us some sense of assurance to believe that everything happens for a reason, the truth is sometimes bad things just happen. Not because we've been bad, not because we are being punished, not because of anything we've done, but simply because we're alive. And to blame them on God or to give credit to God for it, as Nahum does, I believe is a disservice to God. It hurts. So to go full circle, Rabbi Kushner recalls that during the height of the God is dead phenomena in the 60s, he saw a bumper sticker that said, my God is not dead, sorry about yours. And so in response to those who would say that God has causes tragedies, he said his bumper sticker would say, my God is not cruel, sorry about yours. God does not strike out at us when we go astray. Because the truth is, all of us fall short of the glory of God. And sometimes what happens to us is the natural result of what it is that we do. Right? If you're speeding down Trinity and you get pulled over and get a ticket, God is not giving you that ticket, right? God doesn't want you speeding. And if you get in an accident because you're speeding, it's not God causing it. It's a natural result of doing what we're not supposed to do. And the flip side, if you get hit by somebody who's speeding, it's not God causing that either. It's the idiot in the other car who was not doing what they're supposed to do. That's the actions of others in a chaotic world. But God calls to us, and God says to us, when we are in pain, when we are suffering, when we are in despair, cry out to God, not why did you cause this to happen, but instead, God, I need you to help me get through this. 
Because as Paul says, there is nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God. God seeks not to punish, but to redeem. Not to strike out, but to love. Not to avenge, but to forgive. Not to condemn, but to save. I know it is so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. So for those in the sanctuary, I'm going to invite you to take out your uh, scripture insert. For those who are worshiping online, if you have a piece of paper, we're going to spend a minute to reflect on that. Maybe we've thought about something that's happened in our lives, right? God is punishing me for this. What would it look like if we changed that thought? How would it change our conception of our faith and who we are? Maybe we said it to others to free ourselves from God beating on us Instead, to see God as an actor of love. So if we take a minute to reflect on that message. Oh God, there are times in which we feel distant from you. There are times in which we feel like we are being punished or others have told us that we are being punished by you for what we have done. But we know that because of the gift of your son, Jesus, that we are always so much more than the worst and the best things that we have ever done. That your redeeming grace is poured out for us in all of creation every moment of every day. And in every moment is that opportunity to again say yes to you. To seek repentance for where we have gone astray and ask you to lead us back to that path of righteousness. To live our lives as you have called us to live. To live in peace and joy and love. To act with kindness and gentleness. To live through self-control. To generate the fruits that you have called for us as disciples. So help us when we hear that voice in our head saying that we are not worthy. Or that when others say the same to us. To to shut them aside and just claim you just as you have claimed us, that you have said you are worthy in you, my beloved, I am so proud. Help us to remember that in the waters of baptism, we are not only cleansed of that sin and given eternal forgiveness, but that we are adopted as your beloved children, those who are made in the divine image. And help us then to live that out to tell the world that they are worthy in your eyes too. We pray these things through the power of your Spirit. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and all the church says, Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
So for those in the sanctuary in your worship guide, you'll find an insert, a list of things that are happening around the church. A couple we'd like to highlight first is that uh, there is no programming night uh, tonight because of the uh, holiday weekend. And next Sunday, we'll be doing our fall cleanup during uh, programming night, so it won't be regular classes. Activities just about anybody uh, can, t can participate um, in next week. And for those who have signed up to either provide uh, cookies or placemats for Kairos, the prison ministry. Those need to be to the church by Wednesday of this week. So as we think about um, how we outreach to people who have been, right, we have a retributive justice system. You've done something wrong, we're going to punish you. And one of the things that Kairos does is work on restorative justice. That yes, you've done something wrong. That's not who you are in God's eyes. We want to restore you back into relationship, not just with God, but with each other and into community, right? That's how we reach out and be God's good news uh, to the world. And so if you would like to still participate, there's a sign-up sheet at the back of the sanctuary or contact the office. Uh, there are still slots for the prayer team, Nels, or do you know? Okay, so, but if you would like to be one of the, the prayers for that weekend so that uh, during the entire time is covered by somebody in prayer. Again, you can speak with Nels for those in the sanctuary, call the office, and we will get you added to that list. One of our membership vows is that we will support this church financially, which we say is giving a portion of our income with a tithe or 10% as the goal. Uh, and so for those in the sanctuary, as we're singing our closing song, you can come forward and place your offering into the offering plate. If you've given electronically, you'll find a green card in the pew pocket. You can pull that out and put it into the plate representing your gift. If you'd like to give electronically, there is a QR code on there. You can scan and follow the steps. You can also give through our website, lafumc.org. Click on member and then giving. Uh, follow those steps. You can also text the dollar amount you'd like to give to 84321 or simply mail in your checks to the church. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for making a difference. We are indeed God's love in action. And I'm going to invite you to stand as you are comfortable. Again, remain seated if that's more comfortable as we sing if, uh, Finding Our Assurance in God.
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me Another one of our expectations is we'll be reading the Bible daily. So in your worship uh, or scripture insert, you'll find recommended scripture readings for each day of the week, a prayer for the week to help you do your daily prayer, scripture readings and questions to help you prepare for next Sunday. We move on to the prophet Habakkuk. Uh, next Sunday is a tr traditional worship service. So please take this home and make use of it during the week. Hear these words about how we are to live from Paul's letter to the Romans. Bless those who persecute you Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. <clears throat> Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So go forth to be God's love to the world, and may the love of the Father and the strength of the Son and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Now go, be the church. Oh.
Shine light.